Great. Good morning, everyone. Um, for anyone that doesn't know me, my name is Philip Salter, and I am the uh, founder of the Entrepreneurs Network. So this is one of our kind of regular uh, webinars that we've been doing um, during COVID. Um, this one, I think, is uh, kind of particularly interesting, particularly pertinent um, for entrepreneurs in our network. Um, we're doing this in partnership with uh, with Mish Gondorea, who we've worked with for a number of years on various projects, um, most notably the Leap, which um, look, which kind of supports high growth and highly ambitious entrepreneurs, um, both within our network and outside of our network. Um, so this is specifically on the future of funding, floating and selling your business. I think like some of ours, I'm particularly keen on this, this one because it's intensely practical. And we've got some really great speakers, some speakers who have kind of practical experience in this and also kind of policy experience um, in terms of uh, helping the, uh, the ecosystem and helping, helping make it easier for you guys to, to do that from a policy perspective, which is, which is where our interest is. So our first speaker will be Lord Howard Lee. So Howard co-founded Cavendish Corporate Finance in 1998, which merged with FinCap in 2018, of which he is his chair. Um, he became a peer in 2013 and speaks regularly in the House of Lords on business, finance and tax matters. Um, he chairs a number of charitable concerns and was appointed uh, treasurer of the Conservative Party in 2000. He's also um, part of the APG for Entrepreneurship, which we are the Secretariat of. Um, we're also joined by Kevin McCarthy, who's a partner and chair of the corporate department of Michigan, Michigan Um, He's got over 20 years experience in M&A and private equity, and he's built a really strong reputation in both the UK and international transactional work. So we're going to hear from them first. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free um, to share them in the chat. Um, so you can see the chat function down there. And then I'll come to them afterwards. I'll have some of my own questions as well, but it's always great um, to get questions, obviously, from, from, from you guys, whether you're business owners or advising um, business owners um, um, with, regards to, with regards to the topic. Um, I will hopefully be able to come to you via video as well. So if you get ready to kind of unmute yourself and be on video, or if, if you prefer, maybe just, just your voice and you can ask a question directly. And I think this kind of makes it a little bit more, a bit more interactive. So first up, we have um, Howard Lee talking about his experience of both Cavendish and FinCap and also as, as a peer. So, uh, so over to you. Thank you very much indeed. And, um, and well done on all you're doing. Uh, there's nothing more important in the current economic climate than uh, encouraging the growth and success of entrepreneurs. So uh, everything we can all do to uh, assist in that is going to be of paramount importance over the next few years. Uh, I started Cavendish in uh, some 32 years ago in 1988 uh, because I saw a window of um, uh, opportunity for people who wanted to sell a business and wanted to be advised by someone who had no other interest than just helping them maximize the value to sell a business. So for 32 years, Cavendish specialized exclusively in sell-side M&A. Uh, and in that time, we sold, well, over 600 businesses, uh, all in the SME space. So I guess you could say we're, we're sort of getting the hang of it. Um, and then uh, in uh, a few years ago, we thought to us, as our business evolved, we thought, how do we uh, capitalize on our business? What, what are we going to do to expand? And we did have the idea of doing an IPO ourselves. And we went to talk to FinCap, who we knew were the best in the business, about what do they think of uh, the possibility of us uh, doing some sort of IPO. And they said, um, you are uh, not, it's not going to happen for you. Uh, you haven't got the right criteria and you're a bit small, but funny you should come and talk to us because we were just thinking that as uh, an AIM broker uh, specializing in uh, AIM SME markets, that uh, what would work well with our business was an M&A house. And so uh, negotiations happened and we ended up merging Cavendish with FinCap and contemporaneously listing on the AIM. Quite a complicated transaction, but particularly as we were an LP and they were a limited company. But it meant I've actually um, been through all three uh, tr all, all transactions that I've advised other people to do at once at the same time. Uh, and that successfully happened uh, nearly two years ago. Um, 
and you many people said well that was good because you got us at the top of the market and um, uh, although I most of the partners rolled over two-thirds of their equity nonetheless that is right uh, there, there was a sort of top of the market feeling and many entrepreneurs have come to me in recent um, days to say or recent months to say there's a great feeling of having frankly missed out uh, they were waiting for Brexit they were waiting for the election they were waiting for Brexit to actually happen and then suddenly they were into the um, they were into the uh, COVID and they felt you know all, all deals were off and they missed out on an opportunity to capitalize on the value of their business and um, many people said to me well I, I know I've missed out I don't want to miss out next time what do I do to make sure I don't miss out next time and um, uh, I'm kicking myself that I missed it and my partner's kicking me even harder but that's the reality of what we're going to do about it. Um, now, as it happens, it, 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 it might be that there is a very small window of opportunity for entrepreneurs to consider. The big driver for many entrepreneurs at the moment is uh, the, the, the worry about capital gains tax and the rumor uh, or rumors in the press that uh, the chancellor might seek to increase capital gains tax, which is currently very benign for entrepreneurs. As, as you know, it's by and large 10% for the first million and by and large 20% thereafter. And that first million can be spread around a number of shareholders. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's between 10 and 20%, which is very attractive, whereas the top rate of income tax is 45%. And many people are worried that there will be an equalization of capital gains and income tax, which in my opinion would be extremely bad news. And it's something I hope the APBG entrepreneurs led by Philip will uh, pick up the baton to fight, but it's it's a worry. And for an entrepreneur, the delta is enormous. Um, there are t really three possibilities of what might happen in November. The first, best, is Chancellor says, um, I'm not going to change capital gains tax, leaving as it is. Uh, I might tinker with a few other things, fuel duty, corporation tax, and so on, but I'll leave capital gains tax. Second, worst, he says capital gains tax goes up from midnight tonight, whether that's in its entirety or above X million, 1 million, 5 million, 10 million, we don't know for that second. Third, least worst, is he says capital gains tax is going up, but not until next financial year, which starts, of course, on 6 April. And if that's the case, then there is an opportunity for entrepreneurs to uh, achieve some sort of crystallize, some sort of capital gain between now and 5th April. And a, a number of people have come to us in recent weeks to say, I want a plan to get that. Um, so I want to start planning now such that I could crystallize 5th April. And if in November, when the autumn budget takes place, there isn't a rise in capital gains tax, I can always pause for thought. But to enable me to reach the 5th April window, what do I need to do now to get uh, a deal closed by 5th April? Uh, and there's a lot you can do to get cracking uh, to make that happen. Um, this webinar is, is, is mainly about the longer term uh, uh, process of uh, selling or uh, doing an IPO of a business uh, over a longer term. And there's, there's, um, uh, there's a lot you could do uh, if you sat down and said to yourself, right, I missed the last wave. I am now going to catch the next uptick. When's the next uptick going to be? Probably sort of somewhere around um, uh, three years time when uh, in three years time, hopefully the economy is growing. Uh, uh, the economy will be tilted towards growth as we get towards an election and the COVID is hopefully well behind us. And if you were to do a three year plan now as an entrepreneur, it might be a completely different business plan if you're minded to sell a business than if you are minded to carry on running the business for a longer time. So there's sorts of the sort of things that you might consider, which are apposite to this call. For example, or, or for example, sell or IPO. Um, you would reconstruct your investment profile to uh, make investment now, not worry about the short-term impact on cash flow and profit and loss, so that the three year, in three years' time the, the value of that investment will come through. Same, and that investment it may not just just be in plant machinery and capital. It could be, for example, in the brand. You could launch a big investment in brand now, knowing that the returns will only be two or three years away. But that makes sense for you as an entrepreneur if you're turning things on its head and you're running the business for capital, not revenue. Uh, you would have a good look at your own 
corporate governance. It may be that as a private run business, you, you, the corporate governance is very different to that which might be appropriate as a vehicle uh, that's going to do an IPO or subject to corporate acquisition. And you most importantly need to think, how could the business run without you? If you're the sole owner of the business and the entrepreneur, the biggest worry buyers have about such businesses is, uh, can, you, can the business survive if you disappear off to the Caribbean island with your well-gotten gains? So setting up management structures that allow the show that the business is, is run by uh, your management is vital. It is not just that they do it, but they are seen to do it. So minuting management meetings where you're not present, where decisions are made by management that prove that the business is, is independent. Uh, and perhaps thinking about a, an incentive plan that, that uh, encourages your colleagues to work with you to that exit so they have some sort of benefit as well. The um, one, one business we work with had a very interesting idea, which is they decided to write the information memorandum now for what they would want it to look like in three years time. And they then worked to get the business to that shape uh, in, in three years time, a really interesting exercise, not didn't take that long and it, it provided a lot of focus and thought, what would I like this business to look like in three years time in terms of an information memorandum? And we did that. Likewise, having a good look at your accountancy policies sounds unbelievably dull and ditch water stuff, but many accounting policies for businesses are there because you've just inherited them or they just they always were there and nobody's questioned them. But some, particularly revenue recognition and to some extent depreciation, can make a massive difference to, 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 to profit. And revenue recognition in particular can make a massive difference to EBITDA. And, you, and most private companies are run not for the benefit of HMRC. They're run for the their benefit of, of, of maximizing cash flow, uh, minimizing tax uh, and other matters. Whereas if you're in a, in a period prior to sell or IPO, you might want to think differently. You might want to turn it on its head and think about how you, how you improve the bottom line and little things like the chairman's statement in your audited accounts careful of your be careful of your words be careful what you write remember that a purchaser will read that assiduously in two or three years two or three years time um, because you're a private company by and large everybody on this call you are in the position of you have the luxury of choosing who you want to sell to and therefore you might well decide you want to sell to a, a business that you frankly feel proud to sell to and somebody who's, who you know will look after your employees. And you can take the time to select the ideal purchaser as opposed to having someone imposed upon you. So thinking early about who would you like or what type of business would you like. And one entrepreneur came to me and said, the only business I want to sell to is an overseas business. Why? because an overseas business will keep my brand, they'll keep my employees, they'll pay a premium to come into the UK, uh, and it's much more acceptable to me than, than selling a business to a UK competitor. So spending time thinking about that, and uh, slightly off piste, but as an entrepreneur, thinking about life after the sale. For example, what else is there in your life? If your life is solely uh, uh, evolving around your business, which it is for many people, particularly entrepreneurs, now's the time to start developing other interests so that the sale means that you can do other things after the sale and not uh, uh, at the point of sale, uh, re get, it, get to, the, to the line, look over the line and decide you can't do it because there's nothing else in your life that will fill your time, which I have seen happen of, of a sort of vendor's remorse. Um, and uh, you can, at the same time, start planning on, um, uh, on managing your funds, uh, which will be liquid after the sale. And I know we've got one or two people uh, on, the, on the call at the moment. I recognize once others, Julius Baer and others, who were excellent at looking after your funds. But with a bit of planning, uh, particularly uh, in respect of inheritance tax, which changes after a sale because you no longer have an asset eligible for business property relief it's good to, to start early. Um, I focused on the sale. Um, in my experience, most entrepreneurs do actually want to sell rather than an IPO. An IPO, when you're selling an IPO, you're selling an event which you cannot tell somebody the price, you cannot give anybody any certainty, you can't guarantee it will happen, but you can tell them there'll be a million pounds of costs to get there. That's not an easy sale. 
But for some people, it does work, particularly if you, for example, are a partnership and you want the flexibility of some partners realizing their, their share and other partners staying in and growing a business. Uh, there are IPOs happening. Um, there have been two, really, in, in the recent times uh, in the SME space. The institutions are very selective about what they want. They like investing in medical businesses. Uh, they like investing in businesses that have a balance sheet need in the medical sector. Uh, and they like investing in businesses that have a balance sheet need to grow to take advantage of the opportunities that have presented themselves in the current environment. Uh, so a good example of that was an IPO we did uh, uh, recently of a company called Alexia, which is a consultancy. It had good profit uh, uh, history. It had good profit potential. Uh, it was a consultancy. Some people wanted out. Most people wanted to stay. It had decent staff. The institutions were offered a decent slice of the business, which is all, always important. And the management team were very, very credible. So that was helpful. The um, uh, So the... So I hope that's, that's, that's not too long a uh, thumbnail sketch of the opportunities available to people. And I would be extremely happy to uh, take questions uh, uh, along with Kevin here on in. Absolutely, that was, that was brilliant. And you know, lots of kind of nuggets of uh, information has, has been kind of said in the chat. And I'm sure that, um, yeah, hopefully- Philip, you're on mute. Um, I think I'm not, um, but yeah, hopefully you can hear me in a, in a, in a sec. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll go over to Kevin now, um, and hopefully hasn't kind of, yeah, Howard hasn't kind of stood, said too much that you're, you're planning to say, and then we'll, uh, we'll open up to Q&A. So do put your questions um, in the chat. So Kevin, over, over to you. Thank you, Philip. Um, I hope everyone can hear me, and good morning, and thanks for joining in. Um, so I'm Kevin McCarthy. As Philip says, I, I head up the corporate team at Mishcon, and we do an awful lot of work with uh, entrepreneurs and people who are in the process of selling or looking to sell their business. Um, I think it's safe to say that in the lower and, and mid-market um, and in the area of SMEs, this has probably been the most difficult five to six months that anyone can remember in, in recent business times. Um, it, it is undoubtedly the case that um, the, the COVID crisis has put the brakes on delectivity in a way that we simply haven't seen before. I mean, there have been previous uh, downturns in the market um, and, and recessions, but actually what, what we have seen over the last five months or so has been something quite extraordinary. Um, and I think it's true to say also that uh, it has not been entirely um, single track. It has served as somewhat of a both a break and an accelerator, depending on which particular part of the market you're looking at. Um, I think it's you know our own experience in, in the team here at Michigan is that um, when the crisis hit and when lockdown happened most transactional activity came to a screeching halt. Um, deals which were in train came to an end. Um, deals which were in the pipeline effectively were put on hold. Um, and that remained the case uh, through the summer. Um, but an awful lot was happening underneath uh, the surface um, and speaking to clients, speaking to um, private, um, private offices, private equity, family offices. Um, there was an awful lot of investigative work and analysis taking place during that period. When you, when you have circumstances like this, uh, for many players in the market, it actually represents a fantastic opportunity um, to try to accelerate and do deals that um, might otherwise not have been possible. I mean, th there are obviously pricing and valuation implications in that statement, and we can go back and look at those later on. But um, it, it, was, it was quiet in terms of delectivity, but it was certainly not quiet in terms of activity by way of analysis and preparation for future deals. And I think we're starting to see that now as we come out of um, what has been quite a, a, a quiet summer period, a very quiet summer period, undoubtedly deals are starting to flow. Um, we're seeing private equity, we're seeing trade stepping back into the market, actually huge amounts of um, dry powder, uh, in terms of money being looking for a home to invest in 
um, and, and that is undoubtedly starting to happen. And I think what we can start to see over the, the third quarter, or, or sorry, the, 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 the end of this calendar year and the first quarter of next year is potentially a real pickup, but it comes with lots of caveats. There, there are changes to the market, there are changes um, in behaviors, there are changes in, in terms. And I think it's probably worth um, as um, entrepreneurs who potentially are looking to sell businesses um, or for that matter, um, parties who are looking to potentially buy to understand some of those dynamics in the market and understand what's happening. Um, a, a few themes worth touching on to begin with. Um, I think firstly, it's undoubtedly true to say that deals have become more difficult to do. Um, just the practicalities of it. I mean, for all that we become very proficient now in Zooming and other uh, online platforms, the reality is when you're trying to sell a business, face-to-face um, -face and physical contact with the business and, and its locations has actually been quite important. And at the moment, we're looking for ways to try to plug those gaps, but it's not, it's not easy. Um, there effectively is... Uh, th th there's difficulties in logistics, there's difficulties in, in relation to due diligence, and, and there's difficulties in terms of producing information which plugs this gap. There's a five-month period where information is not as robust or clear. Um, and so what you're finding is, and, and what's important, is um, that there is a narrative uh, which effectively helps plug that period. Um, and so, you know, one of the themes of this talk is to examine, you know, what can, what can entrepreneurs and potential sellers do in order to prepare their business for sale um, and planning the sale of that business. And I think one of the things we've always spoken in the past about prepare, the, the importance of preparation and preparation in, in old money really meant, you know, looking at the business, looking for the weaknesses in the business, conducting a degree of vendor due diligence, looking at your own business in a critical fashion and trying to identify what might be an issue for a potential buyer and then looking to address those issues early. I think one of those preparations now, and if not perhaps what the key preparation now, is how do you address this period, this COVID period, where nothing is normal. Finances may actually look very, very different and a, a canny buyer might look to use that to drive price down. And undoubtedly, there are many dynamics at the moment which serve to drive price down. But a combination of robust internal figures which you can produce, combined with a narrative which really speaks to what effect COVID is having on your business and why hopefully that is not an endemic issue, but it's one which is acute to the COVID period and, and which should not really affect headline value is very important. Um, so that's that's one of the themes. I mean, the, the second theme in terms of what is making deals more difficult is what has become undoubtedly a shift in the the balance of power between what had been a buyer's market, sorry, a seller's market, to what is increasingly very much a buyer's market. Um, you know, the, one of the key issues that we have at the moment is really how how does any buyer realistically value any asset. It's, it's very difficult to do at the moment. So many things are in flux that both in relation to sales, uh, private sales, but also uh, it's an issue which I think is relevant for um, IPOs. It, it's incredibly difficult to properly value an asset at the moment. Um, and so there is downward price pressure. There is opportunistic um, activity. Um, and, and, and sellers need to be aware of that because there may be pressure on, on, uh, in order to, to do some form of, of transaction, but the timing may not actually be right. Um, and also at the same time, we see changes in the market practice relating to some of the key terms on which a business would be sold. There are, there are new issues which are creeping in, which really had not been a feature in the market for quite some time. And again, these are symptomatic of a move and a shifting of the dial from a seller uh, market to very much a buyer market. So the introduction of um, MAC clauses, the introduction of you know, more, more difficult pre-completion uh, conditions, um, 
long stop dates being pushed further out. E even, even a trend which I'm seeing now, which is, I guess, understandable, and that is a combination of extended exclusivity periods um, and also pre, pre LOI uh, due diligence. So what I mean by that is it, it used to typically be the, the format of a deal that parties would explore a deal in principle, they would put together an LOI, you would have a period of uh, exclusivity, and then due diligence would start. And what you're finding now at the moment is that buyers are really treading very carefully before even they enter into those initial phases of the transaction. And so they will ask and try to carry out a degree of pre-LOI due diligence. And so it front loads the whole process. And of course, that itself brings some issues in relation to the disclosure of quite confidential information very early before you know what a bid might be, or frankly, before you know whether a bid is even coming down the line at all. So that's another theme that we're seeing. Um, and then I think one other thing which I would like to mention is the, the role and the evolving role of insurance in relation to these deals. I mean, if you go back about a decade or so ago, uh, many deals reached an impasse because of this tension which existed between selling a business and what you're prepared to say about that business by way of warranty cover, and more importantly, how much exposure you might be prepared to accept in terms of the, the, the consideration that you receive and how much of that may actually be on the line in terms of potential clawback. Um, warranty and indemnity insurance stepped in to try to effectively unblock that impasse and that industry has evolved over the last sort of nine to ten years or so so much so that it is now a, a very common if not the uh, more you know it, in the majority of cases we see now that is a feature in one way or other on, on a deal but covid has also changed that market and unsurprisingly the the threat of covid risk has affected and continues to affect in quite a rapid fashion what um, that type of insurance is prepared to cover and the terms on which it's prepared to step into the breach. Um, and so that brings an, an, an interesting dynamic to, uh, to this type of deal. Um, and, and, you know, it's certainly something which, as I say, it's evolving right now. There are 25 or so players in that market and they are in competition with one another for what is quite lucrative business. And so the, the terms on which they are offering insurance are, are moving in a competitive fashion very, very quickly. And so that's quite interesting, something that you might want to explore also. So anyway, F Philip, I, I've probably said enough by way of sort of key themes there, but these are some of the things we are seeing, you know, uh, and, you know, I'm very happy to talk and uh, take questions at length in relation to any of those or, or other things. Absolutely, you know, that's really fascinating stuff and it builds really well on, um, on what Howard was saying. Um, I wonder in the first instance, Howard, whether you'd like to kind of respond and have, because I guess you came at it from different directions. Um, I guess you're more kind of glass half full. Um, Kevin, um, bring up some more of the risks. So are you seeing the, the same kind of challenges and the same risks despite your kind of optimism, Howard? Yes, I, I mean, Kevin's quite right that there, that there, there are um, challenges and obstacles and clearly a number of deals just died on the, in, in March and are not going to come back um, as did uh, as did um, as did the companies uh, and the, uh, the the insolvency profession has has become uh, busy uh, I was involved in the corporate governance and insolvency bill which I think 10 also APPG entrepreneurs also helped in passage through Parliament and uh, it's it, there are a lot of challenges there for companies who will not be able to enter the moratorium and certainly won't come out of it. Um, but uh, just picking up on a few specific points about uh, that Kevin raised and the, 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 the very important one, warranty and indemnity insurance, it really is um, an extremely helpful uh, part of the M&A market now. Um, it's developed largely into seamless warranty insurance, which means that if there is a claim, these days, the purchaser can go directly to the insurance company, collect the money and be satisfied rather than chasing a, a seller who may have disappeared. Uh, and the key to that is, frankly, the planning, because if you try and get warranty insurance right at the end of the transaction, you'll just hold yourself up for two or three months and the deal will be in danger of dying. So to facilitate, it's more and more important to consider having 
uh, vendor due diligence, or at the very least, vendor assist. That means that you can go to the insurance company fairly early on in the transaction, give them most of the risk areas, and get the insurance in place as part of the package to give to the purchaser. And that makes the transaction much more likely um, to happen. Um, but there are there, there are a number of businesses that are surprisingly doing quite well in the in the current environment. All sorts of businesses that one hadn't expected to, uh, and they find and there is in these sort of and a number of us have lived through um, a, a number of recessions, so uh, familiar with this. What what tends to happen is a flight to quality. So purchasers are even more interested in buying good businesses and less interested in buying bad businesses, and it becomes polarized. Um, the area we haven't really touched on is the appetite by private equity. And I think I'm right in saying that private equity has one and a half trillion dollars as dry powder ready to invest globally in, in, uh, in companies. So uh, they are even more keen to uh, invest in businesses now because they live and die of getting money out the door. Uh, the debt markets are strong. Uh, my debt partners have completed, I think, seven transactions in the last um, four months, which is quite powerful. Uh, and of course, the rates are very reasonable. So um, th 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 there is, there is, the markets are alive and there is still opportunity if you are in a position, if your business is in a position where it can take advantage of the current circumstances and you are trading profitably. So kind of following up on that, and I'll ask Kevin first and then come back, kind of what, which kind of sectors, which kind of businesses are kind of looking better, a better place, I guess, given the lockdown, given COVID, um, given the kind of uncertainty. So um, Kevin, over to you first. Yeah, um, I guess there are no surprises here, really. I mean, if, if we took a step back and, and without the benefit of data and said, who's likely to be benefiting from the current circumstances, we would come up with a list and it would be the right list. It's cloud computing, it's software, video conferencing, online technologies, biotech, food delivery, online shopping, online retail. These are, these are the areas, the sectors, which are really benefiting from a change in the market. And there is a real perception that the market is changing potentially for good. Uh, and I don't mean for the good, I mean for, a, for the long term. Um, and so these, these are sectors, some of them new, new sectors which are, are becoming very much in vogue. So, some of the sectors that were already in vogue continue to be, I mean, as um, Howard referred to earlier, you know, the, the right type of pharma, healthcare, health tech, the, these types of businesses are undoubtedly um, going to do well. So too are logistics businesses, um, businesses which are either already in logistics or which are able to effectively transform and and re re um, designate themselves as logistics business. You know, large large uh, storage space. Um, is, is potentially very valuable at a time when commercial real estate is, is in turmoil. It, businesses which are able to look at the market and effectively redesign themselves or redesignate themselves can take advantage of this. And so I do think that one of the, one of the things I would say to um, the, the listeners on the call at the moment is that if, if you're able to evolve your business into a sector uh, which might not be exactly where you stand today, you can take advantage of, of what is happening at the moment. I mean, I look at something like, it's a sector which is quite close to my heart, which is the, um, the drones sector, uh, unmanned aerial vehicles. And that started off as really a sort of hardware, vehicle, uh, a hardware sector where people were making kit which flew. Um, and the reality is that that sector has evolved and over the COVID period have, has evolved even further to become less a hardware sector, more a software sector, and then software as a services, and, and it effectively morphed into a healthcare logistics sector also over the course of, of COVID. And, and that is a business and a sector which will benefit from that very deliberate refocusing and, and, and rebadging itself. And I think that's something that we can all learn from. Yeah, I, I, I would uh, agree wholeheartedly with that. And it's a great list that Kevin came up with that I would agree with. It's also the structure of your own business. So 
moving as in the drones example into a SaaS, anything that's got a subscription business. And you may as an entrepreneur not be that interested in subscription business because you're hungry for the immediate cash, but the extent you can change your business into longer term fixed revenues with long term clients that are locked in, then uh, the more valuable, you, valuable you'll be. And time spent now considering which sectors have the highest multiples within your industry and then moving your business into that particular sector as opposed to uh, another sector will in, in, enhance the multiple and give an a m much more enhanced result. Um, and it's also the structure within your business. So those people who are fortunate not to have long leases will do much better. Those people who are in a position able to shrink uh, their property uh, quickly will have a boost to their profitability uh, and respond quickly to the dynamics of what's happening in, in your industry. I, I spoke to a client who's got employed a lot of software technicians in the city in very expensive space and he's realized he doesn't, they don't need to come into the city. What, what is the point? They're, they're, these software guys are more than happy to work from home and uh, improve his margins enormously. Um, so thinking about which where you sit within your industry and which where, where you should be uh, uh, classified can add a, a number of points to the multiple which is helpful and perhaps identifying who are the most likely purchasers you can see right now and pitching pitching your business to streamline with them uh, the best case of that is a few years ago was a company called um, uh, seattle coffee company um, they went years ago to Starbucks and said, we, we would like to open uh, a business in, in London uh, under the Starbucks name. This is years ago, and Starbucks hadn't, hadn't even branched out of their hometown, let alone internationally, and they dismissed them. So Seattle Coffee Company started itself as an almost exact replica of, of Starbucks as much as it could, so that when Starbucks did decide to come to London, there was only one possible company that they could buy, and it was an easy buy at a great price. So thinking about how you can make yourself easy for purchasers uh, can yield dividends. That leads nicely on to, I guess, the question around for any business owners that aren't in a kind of one of those sectors, a, a business owner perhaps who's feeling a bit battered by, by COVID and probably coming to a situation where maybe they, they're, they're not making necessarily the right decision because of the, the emotional response to, to what's happening at the moment. Um, what advice would you give perhaps Kevin to any kind of clients that rang you up and said look you know I've been doing this for 10-15 years I'm, I want I want out of it now you know this is this is the the, the, the kind of last kind of recession last kind of uh, financial challenge I, I really want I mean how do you kind of manage that sort of position because I can certainly a lot of entrepreneurs our network you know have had phone calls from people in events and areas like that and they you know you can just hear in their voice that that, that things are things things can be pretty tough right now. Yeah, so I think one thing to say right at the outset, and that is a sale which is a, dis a distressed sale or which has the whiff of a distressed sale about it, will not realize the full value of the company. And therefore, you know, if, if you give the impression that you simply want out and you've had enough, then undoubtedly you will not realize the value that you've put in over the years timing to some extent is everything um but then again of course what we experience at the, what we experience at the moment doesn't necessarily give people too many options um I, I would distinction draw a distinction between companies which are really suffering at the moment because they were really suffering anyway companies which were not performing which had inherent uh, faults in the business model and which effectively were struggling along and this has tipped them over the edge very very quickly M many of those companies are being protected by some of the current legislation in a way that they shouldn't necessarily be uh, be being uh, protected um, distinguish that from companies which are strong businesses and which are simply suffering from the acute circumstances that we currently see those businesses will be good businesses again, provided they find a way to navigate through the current circumstances. Um, the, the government has you know, tried to do what it can by way of providing uh, debt and, and, and other um, programs to help them through. I think the furlough schemes have worked in large part to help companies through this initial period. 
but in essence, you know, good companies have to stand on their feet eventually. Um, the schemes are, are being removed. Um, and I think for a lot of companies who have struggled through this far, the future will involve some form of restructuring event in order to protect themselves going forward. I mean, one of the questions in, um, in the sort of headline of, of this talk was, is debt the answer? I mean, I think yes and no uh, is, is, is the rather confusing answer to that. Debt will undoubtedly play a part in the recovery for some companies, but the terms on which debt is being offered, um, while cheap, as, uh, as Lord Lee says, um, is also increasingly complicated. The, the terms on which um, debt is being lent, the covenants attaching to them, the events of default, which will apply to standard uh, debt are, are increasing and becoming more difficult. Likewise, the debt um, requirements in terms of pre-completion on a sale are not necessarily dovetailing properly with uh, the, the, the deal terms themselves. So the banks are looking for more security than perhaps even the buyers themselves are looking for. And there's a disconnect there, which can be quite difficult. And I think in those markets um, and in these circumstances, we can see, or at least we can predict what we saw last time round. And that is that in circumstances like this, private capital can become very, very important and become a really important player in the landscape. Um, private capital in its numerous guises is not necessarily constrained in quite the same way as institutional capital. And it can step in and fill a vacuum which is there and, and provide another means to see companies through from the current difficult circumstances to slightly clearer waters further down the line. So I think, you know, I think all of these things are, are very much in play and relevant as we move forward. And, and these are the things that companies in distress, and, and let's face it, most companies in, at the moment are in some way or another in some form of distress by the current circumstances that we experience. There are exceptions, but for many very good companies, these are difficult times. Um, and these are the things which will help chart them through the waters. Great, that's, um, that's, that's a great answer, um, Kevin. Um, I've got a question in from um, David Ford, Ford, who sadly can't kind of go to video because of, um, because of his location. He's founder of two businesses, um, both kind of um, round, uh, C round stage, so Ingenica Solutions and Lightpoint Medical. And um, his question was specifically um, around kind of the, the transferring from a traditional revenue model to a SaaS uh, being expensive and particularly in a growing market share. Um, that's only just um, kind of cash positive. Uh, obviously, how would you brought that up? So it'd be good if you have any kind of advice on that. And then also if you wanted to kind of pick up on anything Kevin um, mentioned around debt, that would be great as well. Yeah, thank you. And, and picking up on your, on your earlier question, the, I mean, what's happened over the last three or four years is that everyone, particularly in business, has recognized the risks of uh, business, the uncertainty in business, and how one can't take anything for, for granted, particularly the status quo. And so you're right, a lot of people have come to us and said, I've just had enough, I've got to, I just want to get out. And what obviously one tries to do is school such people into saying, well, look, rather than just knee-jerk reaction and coming out now, which isn't a great time, let's sit down and do a three-year plan that gives you some certainty, gives you a path, and gives you a result. Uh, and, and then at least you know you are going to get out, but you're going to get out at the best time. However, because of the, the nature of, of, of the uncertainty and, and, and stress that people have suffered, um, a third route is to take some, uh, and Kevin sort of, I think touched on this, to take some uh, equity into the business and into your pocket from the myriad of institutions who are now happy to do that. So they're, uh, they're, they're, in the old days, it was very difficult to find any interest from institutions to take minority stakes uh, in businesses, but there are now more than there ever were and there are more structures than there ever were so that institution can put some money into your pocket which is a good thing say 25 30 percent of your business but also put money and experience into your business to do the very thing you've just identified uh, david is help you finance the cost of becoming a much better quality business uh, with repeat revenue and subscriptions uh, than the previous business was uh, and um, yes, it is, it is short term painful, um, but uh, one's got to bear in mind that most people who start a business, the reason they start a business is the ultimate exit. And if you're running a business and drawing out a salary or a different every year, 
dividend every year and someone comes along to you to offer to buy your business at a multiple of let's say 10 what is a multiple of 10 it is someone saying to you i will pay you 10 years profit in one hit on which you will pay a lower rate of tax it's got to be the objective for everyone in business at some point to try and find a buyer for their business at a multiple which is a premium and therefore everything you do at an early stage to get that multiple up uh, will pay off handsomely Great, Howard. And Kevin, one thing I'd like to pick up on is you mentioned the kind of risk of disclosure too early, um, and it's something that's come up in quite a quite a lot of our um, our events. What are the what, how should an entrepreneur kind of approach that um, to to you know, practically? Because obviously, they you know they don't they want to put put off the potential buyer. So um, yeah, be good to know your experience of that. Yeah, I think you can draw a distinction between a buyer which is in your trade or a buyer which is a purely institutional buyer, because clearly the risk of disclosing fully and early to a potential competitor is far greater than doing so to somebody who actually is stepping into the market from a purely financial perspective. Um, but, but the solution is broadly the same. Um, you, you need to have a degree of certainty, first of all, that a deal is in the offing. You cannot simply start spreading information around right, left and centre unless you're clear that there is a deal coming down the line at a price, at least indicative price, that you're comfortable with. And then you do so by controlling the disclosure process. And, and you control that in two ways. Firstly, by setting up a very clear disclosure platform, data site, which you're in control of and which you can decide what goes into that and when. Um, and really managing that process. And you do that incrementally. Not everything needs to be disclosed at a single point in time. More, um, more confidential, more sensitive information can be released incrementally over the course. If you have more than one potential suitor, and that's a lovely position to be in, then the most sensitive information doesn't need to be, should not be disclosed until you're actually quite close to the line with the party that you've chosen to go with that said don't hold up um or don't hold back ra rather lots of difficult information till the 11th hour that will blow up trust it will cause deal issues you need to be talking about the things that are troubling you because they will trouble a buyer as well and then ultimately um i think one of the solutions which has evolved into the market is the concept of a clean team and that is to say where actually the information that you have and don't want to disclose and a buyer doesn't have and absolutely needs to have and see in order to finalize a bid um, that that information can be made available to an independent third party the, the clean team who effectively can evaluate that information for the purposes of the buyer's bid, relay to the buyer the essence of the information or at least what effect it will have on pricing or the rationale for the bid without necessarily disclosing the full facts of what that information contains. So structures have evolved over time to try to deal with that. But I think you know, for most businesses, it's about controlling the flow of information, the timing of that flow, and again, speaking to the people, speaking to the buyers and, and keeping a, a clear and open narrative with them so as to try to avoid bombshells late in the day. I think that's important. Great, thanks, Kevin. Um, we've just had a, a message in from Rick Lowe. Rick, did you want to go to video or should I just, <laughs> um, I'll ask you to unmute, there we go. Yeah, can you hear me? Hello, great. Hi, guys. Really, really interesting. Yeah, I just wanted to check. I, I thought the Chancellor had done away with the ten percent um, entrepreneurs relief. Is, is it still in in situ, or has it been done away with? It's there for the first million pounds of gain per right. person per person. So you might want to consider your shareholding structure to benefit from that. Uh, in other words, have a, a, a number of shareholders who can each benefit from the million pounds uh, uh, who are directors or active in the business. 
Right. OK, thank you. And just to pick up on, on Kevin's point about disclosures, um, there's a quite a fun ruse we've done once uh, or twice uh, called reverse disclosure. So if, for example, you're in a retail business and the absolutely critical question is the, the takings per um, particular outlets, what you might do is say to a purchaser who you're not sure of his intent, whether or not they're genuine buyers, is we will disclose the revenues for certain outlets, but you, purchaser, have to disclose similar information in respect of your outlets. So that if you're just on a fishing trip, we end up with that information as well. And if the purchaser is reluctant to disclose that information, it does question their intentions. Um, and, 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 of course, most sellers of businesses are private companies, so they don't have the same restrictions as public companies. You do not have to disclose the same information to, same, to every buyer. You can disclose different information to different buyers. And the great thing about virtual data rooms is you can look to see which information is of most interest to buyers, where they're spending their time, and monitor your releases according to what you see that, that they are looking at. And it also tells you if a buyer is seriously interested, if they're putting the resource to go into the virtual data room to get a grip on, for example, your finances, that's helpful. They're a serious buyer. A buyer who claims to be serious but doesn't put resources into your virtual data room uh, can be discounted. Excellent. Thank you. For, thank you for the for that clarification. Um, I guess kind of following up on Rick's comment, I guess, because it kind of brings to light, I guess, a lot of kind of where we intersect. Um, and you mentioned previously of kind of CGT. What kind of advice would you give entrepreneurs in general of dealing with the impact of basically budgets and government policy on 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 that? So I'll ask you first, Howard, and then ask Kevin, because I, I think our experience is we have a huge network of entrepreneurs. Sometimes they have time to you know come along to these sorts of things and deal with this but obviously if they did it full time they wouldn't have time to run their business and probably wouldn't have the mental health uh, to, to deal with you know the political machination so what, what what's your advice on, on that front uh? well absolutely my first piece of advice is wearing the APPG entrepreneur's hat is get involved write to your MP explain to him or her how disincentive an increase in capital gains tax would be explain to your MP who probably doesn't understand that the, the reason why income tax and capital gains tax should not be equalized is capital gains are returns on capital that you've invested, which is risk money. Income tax is taxed on money you get sitting as an employee. The two are not the same and leveling up is just a completely inappropriate phrase. And you'd be amazed how your MP, depending on where you are, wouldn't have thought of that. And so the more pressure you as entrepreneurs can put on to parliamentarians and media and get the word around to explain why levying up capital gains tax and income tax isn't appropriate, the, uh, the, they will listen and it will have an impact and it will feed through. So that, that's what I would say, Philip, is, is what, what every entrepreneur should just spend a few minutes bashing out an email uh, to that effect. Right, Kevin, how, how do you kind of deal with the political risk, I suppose, of these sorts of um, kind of financial events with, with your clients? Is it, um, is it a challenge? It is a challenge because, as Lord Lee referred to right at the top of this discussion, you don't actually know what's going to happen until it has happened. And sometimes that is retrospective, in which case there's nothing you could have done about it in the first place. And sometimes it's from the, the point in time, and sometimes it's future looking. Um, but, you know, it, it, what it means in practice is that any planning you try to implement in terms of what you think might be coming is it's a bit of a gamble because you don't really know what's going to happen. And it's not a two way bet. I mean, you can end up actually taking steps to to try to second guess what's going to happen and end up in a worse position than you were in the first place. So, you know, I think, you know, the advice we give our clients is, you know, th th that they need to plan sensibly and for good commercial reason, but they, 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 they don't necessarily take a punt on what the, the, the budget might be or what the tax change might be, because you can be on a hiding to nothing if you're trying to second guess, especially at the moment, um, what is going to happen and when it's going to happen and with effect from when. So, uh, but at the same time, I mean, there are sensible steps which can be taken in always in order to mitigate and to, to put in place sensible and, and um, proper tax planning. 
Great. I've got another question from Rick. So you, you're getting all the benefits. Um, I should say I know Rick from um, from the Guild of Entrepreneurs. So he's in, he's involved with that organisation. So Rick, do you want to um, ask your your, your yeah? Second question? It, it's a scenario, Lord Lee and Kevin, that I'm kind of in at the moment. So one of my businesses has been approached for a purchase. So currently, it's got a negative balance sheet because of the investment that's gone in, but it is quite profitable so for example last year it earned half a million pounds that's after some fairly heavy salaries going out for the directors so my initial conversation with potential buyer and it may not be the right time for us for a number of reasons but my thoughts would be that basically with the three directors gone um the trading profit is higher so the the value of the business is, is probably more than what it would show as a trading profit. However, there's a negative balance sheet, so does that impact the valuation? Plus it's got plenty of cash in the bank. So, so I suppose it's, you know, there's never a perfect situation, but it, it feels to me that there's an opportunity for them to acquire us and strip out some overhead to, to win profit back. But there's a negative balance sheet that's got to be dealt with. Uh, thank you, Rick. Well, the, the, um, normally uh, businesses are valued on multiples of EBITDA and then an adjustment is made for the, for the level of debt. If it's a negative balance sheet just because of a goodwill write-off or something, then that's not, not going to have any effect at all. Uh, if you, the reason I talked about in my, in my planning points is distancing yourself from the business and proving that management are running the business, not you, means that you can add back and uh, director's remuneration comfortably. And that, frankly, is the part of the negotiation that, 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 that is the fun part that, that you or your advisors will be doing, which is to add back everything possible that the purchaser won't need to incur into your EBITDA. And by the way, uh, I've heard a number of people refer to EBITDAC, which is earnings before interest, depreciation, amortization, and COVID. And <laughs> <laughs> and people have tried to normalise profits, excluding COVID, which is, you know, why not? Um, but there, there are not, a directors and monuments is the obvious add back, but in fact, a skilled, experienced advisor will probably find quite a lot of add backs. And then it's a negotiation with the purchaser who won't accept all the add backs, because some of it they'll say is what they're bringing to the party, and some of it you might get away with. So it depends on the numbers, uh, but uh, if you are, if there's a, if there's a modest, balance sheet shortfall then I don't think that would uh, impact oh, at all. Perfect. The question you need to ask yourself is is this the time for me to get the best premium on the multiple for my business yes. or the best way? Sure. sure. Evan, would you would you add anything to that at all? The only thing I would add to it is to perhaps be a little bit inventive about how the consideration is paid. And so in essence you you're both wrestling with the same issue here. You, you don't want to sell too cheap, they don't want to pay too high. Um, and you're saying that this business will perform and demonstrate itself to be worth X. And they're saying, well, hold on a minute. At the moment, we don't know that and we're only prepared to pay X less. And so if you build in a structure which effectively says, you know, if this business performs in the following way over the next one, two, three years, then there's more in this for us so as to enable us to take the full value off the table then effectively you deal with both concerns. And, and so think about how the structure is. If you think that the deal isn't rich enough for you on the, on the straight cash number, then start to build in some of these additional things, which effectively are no risk or minimal risk for a buyer, but can deliver to you the full value of the business over time. Excellent. Um, I guess that we're coming up to 12 o'clock. I think it's um, fair to, to, to end this on time. I think a lot of these things um, kind of roll over too, too far. So it just leaves me to both thank Kevin and, and um, Howard for what was extremely kind of efficient. There was no fat on this uh, webinar at all, as far as I could see. A lot of really useful information. Um, there'll be a video of this that we'll, we'll have, have up. But I think more importantly, it probably, I'm sure there's lots of people um, listening in who probably want to follow up either either with Kevin or, or with Howard so do drop me an email and I'll kind of put you in touch um, and I hope that we can do this again actually in uh, in a few months time kind of exactly the same panel because this was particularly particularly interesting particularly useful and um, I do hope everyone enjoyed it so that just leaves me to to thank Kevin and 
Howard and for Mishcon for supporting it and um, have a great the rest of the day and rest of the week, everyone. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Philip. Thank everyone. Delighted to hear from people if they've got questions. Likewise. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.